reading this morning from the 12th chapter of Luke, beginning in verse 49. I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on in one house there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for bringing us now into your presence in a special way. You are always there. We could not escape your presence, but Lord, we now in the next few moments, as we have been in the last few moments, want to continue in your presence with you being the forefront of our mind, not the things that are going to go on this afternoon or tomorrow or this week, not the problems that are inevitable in life, but for now, may we see you high and lifted up. Know a little more about who you are. And Father, be motivated to give our life and heart to you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. <coughs> Abraham Lincoln, as most of you know, was a famous storyteller as well as president. One of the stories he liked to tell had to do with a man who enlisted in the War of 1812. His girlfriend, as he was getting ready to go off to war, told him that she'd like to create a belt for him to remember her by, and she wanted to embroider it with something. She suggested victory or death would be the words that would go into this belt. He looked at her and he said, don't don't you think that's that's a little strong? Maybe, Maybe something like victory or be wounded or something, right? Wanted it a little less, a little less definitive kind of wanted to be half in, half out. But you know, a half-committed soldier is a danger to everyone, right? Half-committed soldier is a danger to everyone. And Jesus' followers, according to this passage of Scripture, and many others, must be those who are all in. In fact, to be half in, half for him and half for me, is kind of a, I think it's kind of a modern It's almost an American invention. Not that you can't find it other places, but we like this idea of ease and comfort going along with our Christianity. We're kind of yuppie Christians. In fact, there are whole churches full of them. Half in, half out. But the message of Jesus is you're either all in or you're not in at all. See, Jesus never taught it any other way. Way. It's, a, it's a figment of our imagination. And so here in this passage, he's been urging preparation on the part of his followers for his coming, right? He's been telling them, I'm coming again, so you need to be ready. You need to be ready by waiting expectantly, expect at any moment. Live as though that's the truth that's going to happen. Whether it happens in your lifetime or not, then it means you're going to live the, a godly life. And I want you to work, work, work earnestly during that time. But now, as he comes to this point, he begins to explain why. Why is it so important that that servant who is working faithfully is is rewarded and has heaven to look forward to, and the one who is unfaithful is condemned, as we saw last week. Why is that? We're going to see the reason is that it has to do with the death of Christ. And what Jesus says in this passage is really shocking in some ways. The death of Jesus is the great dividing point. It soon forces a choice on every 
buddy. It's eternal life or eternal death. That's how important this all is. And so we want to look at this passage, three points, simple points, but, but profound from the person of Jesus Christ as he teaches us something here. First of all, let's look at Jesus' surprising strategy, or you might even call it shocking strategy. And you see it right there in the first comment, Luke, 9, uh, Luke 12, verse 49. I came to cast fire on earth. And then skip down to verse 51. Do you think that I come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. I mean, wow, where, where did that come from? The disciples, just as we would be, have to be asking themselves, what is this all about? Isn't Messiah the Prince of Peace, according to Isaiah 9, 6? Didn't Zechariah when Jesus was born, issue his comment about Jesus being one who would guide our feet into peace. Didn't the angels at the time of Jesus' birth sing peace on earth to, to those in whom he is well pleased? Didn't Jesus himself pronounce blessing on the peacemakers? And I suppose the strongest passage of all would be the one that Paul gives us in Ephesians 2, verse 14, where he says concerning Christ, he is our peace. So if we have all this peace going on and surrounding the message of Christ, where does this come from? I want to cast fire and I didn't come to bring peace. What's that all about? Well, the simple answer is this. Jesus did come to bring peace. Absolutely. It's what his whole life was about. Jesus came to bring the most important peace that there is. Jesus came to bring peace between a hopelessly lost humanity until we've seen and understand that apart from Christ, that's exactly who we are. Can't even keep New Year's resolutions, let alone meet the standards of a holy God. Jesus came to bring peace between a hopelessly lost humanity and an infinitely holy God. But the price of that peace is huge. And the price of that peace causes something else. It automatically means war with a world system that denies God, that denies that they need God, that denies that there is a possibility of a God that says the supernatural is out, the natural is in. We are responsible for ourselves and we can do it on our own. Peace with God means enmity with a world system that says that. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. That's what's reflected in his comment, I came to cast fire on earth. If your concept, beloved, if your concept of Jesus is as a, a meek and mild, you know, kind of milk toasty kind of guy who wouldn't hurt a flea and was all about the kids, you have the wrong concept of Christ. That is not the Christ of the Bible. That's a Christ of your own imagination or the imagination of somebody who taught you somewhere along the line but was not honest with what the Bible teaches. The Jesus of the Bible is different. That Jesus came to stir up everything, including you and me. Believe me. That Jesus came to stake claims on lives. That Jesus came to cast fire on earth. That Jesus came not to be ignored, but to be believed. Now, the first thing we have to look at here obvious, is obvious, right? What does it mean to cast fire on earth? What does that mean? To the Jewish people living in Jesus' time in the first century, the concept of fire would have brought two things to mind. First and foremost, from the Old Testament, they would have known that fire represents judgment. Represents judgment. Genesis 19, 24. I'm just going to read a, a couple passages here. Don't try and turn them. You can make note of them. But Genesis 19, 24. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Psalm 11:6. 6. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. Isaiah 66, verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come in 
fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. And the list goes on. I could probably read a hundred passages like that from the Old Testament. They knew that fire means judgment. And Jesus is saying when he says, I came to cast fire on earth, he's saying, I came to cast judgment on earth. Make no mistake, when Jesus, what Jesus did in dying to pay the penalty for sin automatically became the basis for judgment. He came specifically to set the stage for what's going to happen in the future. But the people in Jesus' time also knew there was another meaning for fire in the Old Testament. It also referred to and represented purification. For example, a passage like Malachi 3, verse 2, Malachi 3, verse 2, where God says, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? Speaking of the coming Messiah, for he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. We know what soap is, right? Soap is what we wash our hands with, take a shower with to get clean. What was a refiner's fire? It did the same thing. It took ore that was not cleansed set a fire to it, melted it down so that the dross would come to the top and the heavy gold or silver or whatever it is would go to the bottom and you could scoop the, the bad stuff off the top and purify the ore. That's the refiner's fire. And God uses that to represent what he does in the life of believers. So, when Jesus talks about casting fire on earth, he means this. He means that it will be the fire of judgment for unbelievers. It will be the fire of purification for believers. It's the same fire, but it has two completely different reactions. Jesus' presence, beloved, demands a reaction. No reaction is a reaction. No reaction is a rejection. Jesus' person. If you really think about this, if God in, came to earth and took on a human body, doesn't it naturally follow that there has to be a claim on the life of every person and a response demanded? And that's what Jesus is saying here. He doesn't draw a line in the sand. He is the line in the sand. To follow him is to experience the fire of purification and cleansing in your life because you need it. To reject him will be one day to experience the fire of judgment. Either way, he makes things hot. And he will make things hot for you as well. One way or the other. He came to cast fire on earth. You remember, when the, when, when the reaction when the Allies came into Paris at the end of World War II in December of 1944, the war wasn't quite over yet, but they finally came to Paris and took Paris back. And you remember, you've seen the newsreels and everything, cheers everywhere, right? Everybody's out there hugging these soldiers. Just everybody is with wild acclaim. Well, what about the Germans who were in town? And they were headed out as fast as they could go, right? What about the collaborators? They were on the same road out. Why? It's the same troops, it's the same time, but totally different reactions. Why? Because the presence of the Allies meant liberation for the French, right? But it meant condemnation for the Germans. Same people, same time, totally different reaction. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He casts a fire on earth. A fire of judgment for some, a fire of purification for others. The difference, the difference is that some will submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, most do not. But he came to cast fire. There was an interesting uh, comment in the, a newspaper called the Fresno Bee. I don't remember where I picked this up, but we do know Fresno. We lived in California so many years. Uh, Fred, the Fresno Bee had a, had a weather forecast one day that went like this. Precipitation is likely to be lower than normal, higher than normal, 
or roughly the same as normal. <laughs> you talk about straddling in the fence, right? Somebody did a great job of it there. But that's, see, that's what many want to do with Christ. They want his blessings, but they don't want his lordship. They want it for the funeral, but they don't want him in life. They want, they want what he can give them. They don't want what he asks of them. They want him on Sunday. They don't want him the rest of the week. Beloved, let me tell you, I mean, just straight as I know to tell you, Jesus won't go there. He doesn't go there. If you think you can hang on to what you want with one hand and Jesus with the other, you need to think again. Jesus doesn't do half in and half out. He's come to cast a fire and it's either a justifying fire or it's a condemning fire. The, the choice is that, that choice is up to us, but he will not be ignored. We may think we can. We may think we spend our whole life ignoring him, but we will find out at the end that we, it did not work. He came to cast fire. The only question is which side of the fire are we on? That's the question. Now, the second point that we want to go to here helps us understand why the presence of Jesus causes this kind of very definitive reaction, okay? What is it about the presence of Jesus that makes this all true, what we've just been saying? And the answer to that question is Jesus' supreme sacrifice. Jesus' supreme sacrifice. Verse 49 again, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it had already been kindled. He's anxious for this to be kindled. What is he anxious to be kindled? Us. Right, he'd like us to be kindled, but in this case, he's talking about his death. He's talking about the thing that will cause this fire of either judgment or purification. You see, the problem of sin and guilt is way deeper, way wider, way broader than we will ever acknowledge. We just don't understand who we are in light of the holiness of God. Sin demands payment. Listen, beloved, we know that even from a human perspective, right? We have court systems. What are they for? They're so that sin can be paid for. But those are just kind of the worst sins in a sense, the sins of lying and the sins of misrepresenting and the sins of intolerance and the sins of selfishness we don't do anything about. But you see in the court of God where perfection is the standard, those have to be paid for as well. There's no sin that can go unpaid ever. And the payment has to be made either by the person who has been the sinner or by the person of Christ who came to assume that judgment on our behalf to cast fire on earth if we would submit our life to him. And that's what he's thinking about here when he says, I'm going to cast fire on earth and I wish it had already been kindled. That statement, is, it's heartrending when I read that. This is kind of like the humanity of Jesus on full display. Because what he's thinking about is his coming death. The judgment, the fire of judgment has not yet been kindled when he speaks to this crowd, but it's coming soon. And Jesus is anxious to get on with it because the price is going to be so great, the penalty so horrific. Cost. So amazing that he wishes it was done and over. Oh, would that it were already kindled. When I was a little boy, well, not that little. I was old enough to know better, but I don't know, 10, 11, 12, probably 12 years old. Ice cream was a luxury in our house. We, uh, we kept getting more little brothers instead of ice cream, right? <laughs> a couple sisters at the end. But all those mouths meant that there was a lot of mouths to feed, and ice cream was a luxury that very seldom got on the menu. But one day, I knew that there was ice cream in the, uh, you know, the big chest-style deep freeze out on, the, out on the back porch at our house. And I decided I could help myself to a spoonful or two, and nobody would know the difference, right? The devil made me do it, folks. I mean, what can I say? 
So I got my spoon and I opened the freezer and I, I got my ice cream. And then I put it back, but something had shifted, something had moved, and when I closed the lid on that freezer, I heard this crunching sound. <laughs> and I opened it back up again and the insulating, um, uh, you know, part of the freezer on the inside of the lid had broken. It was all cracked. I knew I was in big trouble, let me tell you. Uh, it wasn't long before my mom found out about that. She was in and out of that freezer all day long. It didn't take her long to put two and two together and knew who might be out there in that freezer, and I had no choice but to confess. But then she did something I wish she hadn't. Instead of disciplining me right then and there, she said, wait till your dad gets home. <laughs> now, my dad was very, my, my mother was very capable of exercising discipline, but she thought this was one that deserved more. What do your dad get home? That was a long day. That was a long day. I was very fortunate. My dad was a dad who was a godly dad. He disciplined as God disciplines. He understood about godly wrath, and that's the kind he generally had, especially with us older kids. I think the more kids he had, the more it tended to be more angry, but not with me usually. It was out of love. It was done right. But he didn't pull any punches either. He told you why you were being disciplined, and then if it required it, he spanked you. Now that part of it I could take. I mean, especially by the age of 10, 11, 12, whatever I was, I didn't even worry about that. It was the tears that killed me. Because I knew he'd cry. It was a long, long day waiting for the wrath of my father to be kindled. Do you see? And that's what Jesus is saying here. If you multiply that by a million billion times, you know what Jesus meant when he said and would that it had been kindled. He sees the cross coming. He knows it's coming. And he wants to, to get on the other side of it. Because it is the cross we're talking about here, right? It is the cross. Look at verse 50. He says there, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how great is my distress until it is accomplished. The word distress there is a word which means to hem in or to press. If you've ever seen one of those thrillers on television, you know, where some guy is locked in a airtight compartment and so, somehow water is coming into this compartment and the more the water comes and his head gets up to the top as high as he can go and he can't go any higher but the but the water is still going you, you have nightmares about that right and that's what this is talking about he's hemmed in as jesus looks forward to the cross this is the way he feels but you see the cross has loomed over jesus his whole life have you ever seen the picture, as you come down our stairs from the upstairs in the kids' room, there's a picture at the bottom. And it shows Joseph, who is exercising his carpentry. And as he's exercising his carpentry, there's little Jesus playing on the floor with, you know, some spikes as a little two or three-year-old kid would do. But, but his shadow is casting a shadow that looks like a cross. What's the author representing, or the, 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 the painter representing? Holland is his name, and he's representing that the cross forever loomed over Jesus his whole life. In fact, it was longer than that, beloved. Did you realize that the cross of Jesus loomed over, the cross loomed over Jesus for eternity? First John 1, verse 19 says this. It says that we are ransomed with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Death for sin has been on Jesus' radar forever. Now you think about that and realize that as Jesus realized now after eons of time have gone by and he's finally come to earth and the 30 years plus, the 32 and a half by this time have been lived and now that cross that he's been thinking about that has loomed over his head forever is almost here. The water has risen. Oh, he's so anxious for it to be over. He tells his disciples about it. He prophesies that this is what's going to happen, but they don't, none of them get it. They don't understand. He is absolutely alone in his distress. Gethsemane, of course, is the place where this comes most to the forefront, right? And he is 
totally alone in Gethsemane as he, as he deals with the Father in this climactic battle, but in a way his life is one perpetual Gethsemane. The cross has always loomed. I have a baptism to be baptized with. You know, we miss the intensity of this. With us, baptism in our day and time is usually a happy event, right? It's a, it's a celebration. Most of the time it's done in heated water and everything is good. But boy, that's not what Jesus is talking about. The only reason we can have that kind of experience of identifying with Christ and telling the world, I am Christ, the only reason we can have that is because he purchased the right to do that with a much different kind of baptism. Baptism in the cross. So the word baptize means to immerse, to put under water. It means to be overwhelmed. And as Jesus thinks about the cross, as he's getting closer and closer, he's becoming overwhelmed with the thought of what awaits him there. Now you have to ask yourself, so what, is it the terror? Is it the terror of the, of the physical element of this that so has him so worried, so anxious? I don't think so. We know many men, including many Christians, many people, men and women both, who have gone to some kind of horrendous death calmly. You, know, you read the story of Socrates, and he practically says, hemlock, bring it on. I mean, people can, can do that. So Jesus certainly wouldn't have been any less than that. But what is it if it's not that that overwhelms Jesus? You know what it is? It's the anticipation of what Paul says when he says concerning Christ that he was going to become a curse for us. Galatians 3.13. It is the horror of the devastating torrent of sin that Jesus sees coming in his direction. Just like that boulder in Indiana Jones at the beginning, right? That's going to run him down. The only difference is it ran Jesus down. So that every lie we've ever told, every instance of fornication, every instance of adultery, every instance of rape, every instance of child abuse on the part of those who would come to believe in him, every instance of every sin that's ever happened came upon him. So that the Bible can say in, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, for our sake God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That's what Jesus is seeing. Put it another way. Here's what crushed Jesus was the thought of becoming you and me. That's what crushed him. The next time you think you're wonderful, beloved, go back to that thought. Jesus was crushed at the thought of becoming who you are and who I am. So why did he do it? Why didn't he just go to the Father and say, you know what, Father, I can't abide the thought of being separated from you. Our wills have been one for all eternity. Our love for each other has been one for all eternity. Our fellowship together has been sweet and constant for all eternity. Even this time that I've come to earth, I grant you this physical life is not a a bowl of cherries, but our relationship has never wavered. Don't impose this on me. The prospect of the breach is too much. Let me come home. Let me tell you, when you read the prayer that Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, Mark 14, 36, it's, it almost reads like that. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Thank God he went on, right? He said, yet, not what I will, but what you will. Can you sense the agony of that plea, beloved? Can you sense the feeling that he was going through? So why did he do it? Hebrews 12 tells us. Hebrews 12, 2. The writer of the Hebrews tells us that it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, despising the shame. The reason Jesus did this, the only way he could do this, is Jesus looked ahead. The same thing he tells us to do, live for eternity instead of for now, he did. And when he looked ahead into eternity, he's, here's what he saw. It's in Revelation 5, 9. What he saw is, is what 
John says when he, sa when he says in Revelation 5, 9, for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And he goes on to describe how these people, all the spirit backgrounds, all completely different times in history that they live, com completely different kinds of people. And there they are all around the throne. He saw the redeemed of all the ages. That's what Jesus saw. And that's why he went to the cross. That's why he said, okay, I'll go. I'll go. I'll go and I'll kindle the fire. I'll be overwhelmed by, well, by the baptism of sin and filth and wickedness and evil. I'll take it so that these people can be saved. I'll do it because of what Isaiah 53 says in verses 4 and 5. It says, surely he has borne our griefs. He wasn't bearing his own and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, suffering the wrath of God in our place and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He didn't go for his own sake. He went for our sake and for the sake of the Father. Despite the distress, he went. And notice, at the end of that verse, it says, he went until it was accomplished. This is another way we know this is absolutely talking about the cross in Luke 12. Because that word accomplished is a form of the same word that Jesus said on the cross when he said, to tell us thy, it is finished. He said, I can't wait till this fire is lit and finished. When was it finished? It was finished on the cross. What did he complete? He completed the payment for sin, but beloved, he didn't finish it by going halfway. And to go all the way. He wasn't half in and half out. So does he have a right to ask us to be all in if we're going to be his followers? Can you see now why it's so evil to reject him? Would the father have asked his son to go to the cross and suffer this breach that hurt the father every bit as much as it did the son, would he have asked for that to happen if it wasn't absolutely necessary? That would be unthinkable, would it not? So do you see why the cross draws a line in the sand that basically says, if you come and say, no, 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 I don't need Jesus, I'm good enough, I'll earn my own way, my merit is fine, I compare myself with others and I look good, Every time we do that, what are we doing? We're saying to God the Father and to Jesus, you didn't really have to do that. How foolish could you have been? That's why the worst sin that there ever is is to reject Jesus. The worst sin there ever is is to say I'm good enough. The worst sin there is is to say I can make it on my own. No wonder hell is in the future of every person who ever rejects Jesus Christ, is it? It's the most costly gift in history, but beloved, you can't come halfway and say, I want Jesus, but I want all, everything else that I want to. It all has to be submitted to his lordship, or it's not real. My grandmother used to tell me years ago, <laughs> she loved to tell me how they came from Iowa to Nebraska in a covered wagon, and then... She would talk about some of the things that went on, but then she would tell me about the wildfires that they feared. They feared prairie fires in those days. They were absolutely paralyzing to people at that time. We can't kind of imagine what that was like when, before everything was all farmed and put under agriculture and so on. But I read one time of a father and his daughter who were on the plains of Canada somewhere and a, a great fire suddenly was coming toward them and there really was nowhere to go. They had no escape. The wind was blowing it in their direction. And they were in great fear. But the father had a plan. He quickly lit a fire and stood behind it so that the wind blew that fire away from them. And then when it had cooled off sufficiently, and of time they stepped into where the fire had already been, the girl was still absolutely terrified as the other flames rolled their way toward them. But the father said, honey, don't be afraid. The flames can't get us here. We're standing where the fire has already been. That's what the cross is, beloved. That's where 
the fire of God's wrath has already been. But that's the only place it's already been. And so if you want forgiveness from sin and relief from guilt and a relationship with the Father, you must come to the cross where Jesus has absorbed the fire of God's wrath on your behalf so that you can have the fire of his cleansing. Jesus' supreme sacrifice. That leads to the last thing here, Jesus' severing specter, or you might call it divisive presence, his divisive presence, verse 51. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. And then he goes on and talks about how even within families, father against father, sons against parents, mother-in-laws against daughter in law Some of us don't need Christ to get in the middle of that to have that, right? But it's there. And what he's talking about is when it's there because of Christ. You know, it kind of reminds you of the old Rodney King thing. You know, why can't we all just get along? And the answer spiritually is really clear. The reason we can't all get along is because peace with God means enmity with the world. And vice versa. It, you know, that never surprised Jesus, not in the least. He understood that what he stood for and who he was, his presence and his work would be like a lightning rod of antagonism against those who would reject him, against those who were absolutely consumed with the idea that they could make it on their own or some who were totally irreligious and didn't worry about it at all. They would all mock. They would all make fun. They would all reject the idea that someone would have to come to Christ in independence on him, ask for forgiveness from sin. But that priceless gift comes with enmity with the world. So if you get peace with God, you got enmity with the world. It's automatic. James says it this way, James 4, verse 4. He says, you adulterous people. He didn't mean physically at that point. He said, did you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Listen, we have to pick our poison. Everybody does. You can either be a friend of God and at war with the world, or you can be at war with God and at peace with the world. It's your choice, but you can't be both. And if you think you are, if you have the misguided impression that somehow you can be both, the likelihood is very, very, very strong that what you are is at peace with the world and at war with God. And sometimes, unfortunately, that division will cut right through families. That's Jesus' point. He said it just like he wanted to say it. Is that what he desires? Of course not. Second Peter 3 reminds us, you know, if we constantly need reminding that his will, his desire is that all would come to repentance. But he knows that's not gonna be the case. He knows that some will inevitably turn away. Division is inevitable because of that, sometimes within families. Jesus has a severing impact because some will accept him and others will not. He himself draws that line. We'll look at it in more detail later, but in Luke 14, if you just turn over a couple pages, Luke 14, verse 26, he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, does he mean that we literally have to hate our families? Of course not. Beloved, use common sense when you're interpreting the Bible. He's speaking in hyperbole here. But what he's saying is, by comparison of our love for him, that must be totally secondary. And he's saying this, if it's a choice between them and me, your choice must be for me. They cannot save you. They cannot free you from the fire of judgment that's coming. They cannot be your salvation. And so if there's a choice to be made, our love for Jesus must exceed any other. And sometimes that means a high price. Some of you have been there. Some of you are there now. You've had to pay that price. This is not an excuse for us to become obnoxious and overbearing. You won't have to do that 
take a stand for Christ and those who do not will inevitably split from you. I came to cast fire on earth. Max Stiles is an evangelist who was preaching in Magd Magdi, Kenya. A bunch of Muslim students one morning and as he preached, no one moved when he came to the end of his service and gave an invitation. He was disappointed. Felt like he hadn't connected with these students. But after the service, he went outside. One of them came up to him. He introduced himself as Robert. And then he kind of was shuffling around, watching his foot in the dust. And he said, finally he said, he said, sir, what you talked about in there, I, I would like to have that. I would like to have that. And so Max Stiles said, I did what I normally did. I, I, I presented what salvation is all about. I talked about God's holiness, talked about our sin. I talked about the price that Jesus paid to pay the penalty for sin for us. Talked about the need to, com to make a commitment to him to get the good of that, to accept that gift, and the fact that there could be a, a price that could come along with that. He said, when I got done, Robert had clearly heard it all before. And so I asked him, well, Robert, do you want to accept Christ? He said, yes. I said, it seems like you've heard this before. Why, 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 why have you not become a Christian before? What's held you back? Robert said this. He looked down at the clay. He said, making circles in the dust with his foot. And then he said, my father has told me that if I become a Christian, he will beat me. He said, tonight, tonight, I will bleed. He knew what the price was that's coming. And of course, we know that there are others where the price is even higher than that when they come to Christ. Beloved, we have no clue, do we? Let's face it. We know very little about the cost of discipleship in America. It's a blessing and a curse all at the same time. It's, 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 why, Jesus, it's, it's why Jesus' statements seem so extreme they seem so extreme because we're used to thinking we can just have both. We can have it any way we want it. Just have Jesus too. He's just one more God we put up on the shelf. When you begin to understand a little more what the line is and why the line is and what the price was to create the line, you begin to understand, yes, it's true. You begin to understand why there's no half in and half out. You begin to understand why you're either all in or you're not in at all. There's not some course of action that says, I'll, 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 I'll take some of Jesus, but a lot of me. It's just not an option. That doesn't mean that having accepted Christ and having said, I want you to be Lord of my life, that we don't fail. We fail constantly, <laughs> consistently, and persistently. But the question is, where is our heart turned? If our heart isn't turned toward Him, if it isn't fully committed, if it doesn't want to recognize those sins, if it doesn't want to confess those sins, if it doesn't want to get them over with, it would be a sign that the Holy Spirit is not living with them. Beloved, it's all or nothing. He bled for us. Now the question is, will we bleed for him, whatever that means in our life? Let's pray. Father, this is, uh, I realize this is a strong message. But it's not my message, it's your message. It was very clear. I think the disciples must have been a little taken back to wonder why is this Prince of Peace suddenly talking about fire and talking about division? But Lord, I'm sure they got the picture eventually. I'm sure many of them experienced division from friends, from family, from others because they treasured peace with God more than they did peace with man, and so must, so must we. Lord, I'm, I'm thinking right now of anyone here today, someone who has not really made that commitment to you, thought they had perhaps, but they know deep down they've always held back. They can leave church on Sunday morning and it's like they've never been there. There's no ongoing conviction. There's no pressure 
to live a godly life coming from the Holy Spirit within. And it's because they're making the attempt to be half in and half out. It will not work. So Lord, would you please open their heart and Father, cause them to say right now, Father, forgive me. I give you my life. I give you my sin. Thank you for paying for it, for me. And just now I invite you to become my Lord and my Savior. I pray that those who have opened their heart, Lord, would come and ask us a little more about that so we could give them some literature to read, some things to help them begin to grow in this new life. And Father, those of us who belong to you, help us to understand that we live in this wonderful bubble, but that doesn't remove the obligation for us to be faithful disciples, faithfully giving, faithfully going, faithfully working, earnestly expecting and looking forward to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a great way to live, and I pray that would be true of us so that the fires of purification would be continuing to work in our life. Help us now, Father, to make this commitment as we sing this wonderful little chorus that come to the cross. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.